focuses. Um, uh, my focus today is going to be uh, really on the spondyloarthropathies. Um, and it's not a surprise to you guys that this is a family of related diseases. I'm going to focus on AS and PSA. Just wanted to remind you that um, we do see, um, now that we understand the pathogenesis a little bit more, we do see peripheral and axial forms, as well as this up and coming non-radiographic. So patients that you kind of know have inflammatory back pain, but not yet have all the criteria. And, and I, the reason I'm going back to this kind of basic idea is just to remind you as I'm going to go through this alphabet soup of all the new therapies that are coming, you know, is there a chance that we could start these and it might prevent it, or do we just really are just here to treat the symptoms? Um, so this is the spectrum of AS, and as you know, it's a non-radiographic that many of us um, have a conundrum in the clinic. Uh, this slide is just to remind us, um, as you've heard already this morning, um, uh, those that are HLA-B27 um, positive, there could be some triggers of your APC, of your antigen progenic cells that then stimulate um, IL-17, IL-23, which is where many of these new treatments um, uh, that I'm going to talk about. Then switching gears to psoriatic arthritis, we all know it affects the joint and skin, but we also know that it um, also um, affects many other um, organs and comorbidities. So as we're thinking about treatment, we have to think about the patient in front of us and what their predominant uh, symptomatology um, is. And once again, we're uh, now more comfortable. It's really um, at uh, the area of uh, the enthesitis, so where the tendon meets the bone. Um, is uh, an area of active interest, which we now know that something stimulates it, whether it's the um, genetics or the unfolding of the protein, the, the biomechanical stress, because it's happening at these sites, um, um, as well as um, the gut microbiome and dysbiosis, which you heard about earlier this morning, um, that stimulates the IL-23, which then causes, as you can see towards the right of this uh, slide, all of the uh, uh, osteoproliferative, inflammatory, and bone loss that we see in this disease. So this is just to remind us that um, as opposed to maybe some of the other inflammatory diseases that we take care of, this really can present in a very, very wide spectrum um, of symptomatology. So I know this is a busy slide. I, I needed it myself to keep this talk organized, um, and so every time I was trying to uh, look at uh, these uh, different drugs, I had to go back and say, whoa, where, where is it fitting in this, and is it, is it psoriasis, is it psoriatic arthritis, and is it ankylosing spondylitis? So in, in this field, we used to just follow whatever happened in RA, right? So it was first happened in RA, and then the, the sister psoriatic arthritis was a slower growing uh, sort of inflammatory arthritis, so we used to just kind of borrow from their trials. But now we know that uh, we have to stand on our own because there are many treatments that are uh, good for psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, but not ankylosing spondylitis and vice versa. So it's getting um, to be a little more confusing to remember. Uh, so here I just kind of broke it down by drug class, um, and the greens are the people that are, um, the drugs are approved, there are good trials. The yellow is that there are trials stepping up from phase two to phase three, and then reds are where they're not going, they're not moving forward um, in, in that space. Um, and so this is not to memorize, this is just to kind of see how crowded that landscape is. So I'm going to focus on TNF, but not so much all of the TNF, but just to show you what's new out there. Um, so the green bars here are the joint scores that we're very familiar with across all uh, the anti-TNFs. And what I like about this slide is I'm going to superimpose the skin. And as you can see, the skin scores are all higher than the joint scores. Um, uh, and this is just to remind us that they're doing a lot better in terms of trying to clear the skin than we are in trying to clear um, the joints. Uh, so, so there is uh, room to grow um, for our treatments. So what's new in this area, I'm just going to focus on two things. One is um, IV golimumab, an IV form. Uh, where we had just published out through one year now 480 patients that were randomized, um, showing that it is um, good for uh, patients with active PSA. So another option, um, we also show that there's less radiographic progression as well on patients on IV golimumab. The other new thing is actually more of a label change. Um, so this is sertralizumab um, pagol. So we know that many times we have young women in our practice who ask us, um, you know, well, which one should I take? What should I do? Should I stop? You know, it's my baby. It's, you know, I'm finally pregnant. 
And so we, we always tell them that pregnant women are not part of our trial, so we don't really have good data. But now um, uh, the EMA um, has approved a label change um, where this is the first anti-TNF for potential use in women. Um, for both pregnancy and, and breastfeeding. Um, and they also um, are uh, uh, active in the psoriasis trials as well, which I won't go into. Um, but the reason that they can say this about um, safety in pregnancy and breastfeeding um, is due to these two studies, the CRIB study and CRADLE. So CRIB um, is looking at uh, following women on uh, Simsia, um, and they showed that the maternal um, placebo transfer was minimal, and CRADLE is more of a pharmacokinetic study looking at uh, breast milk samples. So this is sort of, you know, really helpful for, you know, that, that young woman who um, is trying to raise a family and having more kids, and what do you do when they have active disease and you really want to keep them quiet? Um, and so this may be um, the drug of choice. Um, they also looked at pregnancy and outcomes in general, so looking at over 500 pregnancies, um, and there were also, um, did not indicate any malformations um, as well. Uh, just to remind you, Arava is an oral option for psoriatic arthritis, um, as well as um, Otesla. I know I'm not telling this group anything new, but just to remind you, PDE4 inhibitor, uh, we all know that this response may not be as robust as we'd like in joints, but not everybody comes in with very severe active psoriatic arthritis. We do have our group with more mild. Um, and here you also see that um, um, towards the end in the PASI 50 and PASI 75 that there is um, some improvement um, in skin. So maybe more for the uh, mild uh, group of patients that we see. So now going on to um, really what is new, which is the IL-17, which we're all tr getting more comfortable with. Um, so IL-17 acts on various um, targets, um, as you see here, and depending on the cell type, differentiates into the multitude of issues that we see, whether thrombosis, inflammation, cartilage damage, as well as the bony erosions that lead to disability. So we have several on the market. Um, if you could just follow the yellow, um, secukinumab is the first, which is approved for all three, so psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, as well as ankylosing spondylitis. Ixikizumab is newer on the market, um, approved for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Um, and then there's a brodalumab, um, which is an IL-17. However, it is um, a receptor antagonist as opposed to the other two, which are monoclonal antibodies. So uh, secukinumab is probably the one that we have the most comfort level with because uh, it's been on the market a little bit longer. And here you see in the future studies showing both um, uh, ACR20 response as well as PASI75 uh, response. Um, and so this made a big splash because it is hitting um, skin scores of PASI100. So this is something that you know we've never seen before. In the joints, um, there is some efficacy, but obviously not as strong as the skin. Uh, what I also like about this is that they've, uh, you know, now have better measures of dactylitis and emphysitis. So in addition to the, the uh, joints um, and skin, we see um, some good resolution of some of the other symptomatology that we see in our patients. Um, so here in the second um, bar graphs, you see the uh, improvement of dactylitis and emphysitis. Uh, I, I took this slide. I know you really can't really compare necessarily across all, but it's just interesting to see um, uh, secukinumab um, next to um, the TNFs because sometimes that's the decisions that, that we are making um, in our clinic. So here it looks pretty comparable, but I know in clinical practice, um, I'm sure all of our experiences um, are, are wide ranging. Uh, this is uh, secukinumab again, but this is for AS. Um, so looking at different doses versus placebo, um, and uh, as well as looking at having um, good results um, in physical function um, improvement. Ixikizumab is newer uh, to the market. Um, it was with psoriasis first, so we probably have a lot of our experiences with dermatology, and now uh, we are able to um, uh, uh, use it for uh, psoriatic arthritis. So here you see in the SPIRIT trials, ACR uh, 20, 50, and 70. Uh, what I'm seeing now in these trials is now we're having more head-to-head, -head, so we're looking at this against uh, adalimumab in this particular graph. So the blue is placebo, um, and then you see the treatment arms is ICSI in two different doses, in the sort of orange-gray, and then in the... Uh, Yellow is against uh, adalimumab, which uh, we're most familiar with. And as you can see um, here, it's showing in the SPIRIT trials that there are uh, some benefits um, 
obviously of both adalimumab and secukinumab, but maybe secukinumab a little bit uh, more in the higher doses. Bradalumab came out to a much more rocky start. Um, so many of you may have heard that when it first started, there were some increased risk of some mental health issues, suicide um, in the active arm, and it did, was only approved in certain areas. Um, now they have mitigated some of that, that risk, and they are moving forward with uh, trials um, in, um, obviously, psoriasis is approved, but psoriatic arthritis as well as ankylosing spondylitis. Um, here is um, also in the IL-17 family, however, this one is for blocking both IL-17A and F, so um, bimikizumab, a uh, monoclonal IgG antibody, um, is being tested in all three diseases. Uh, this is really much more early now in dose ranging stages, and you'll see it against anilimumab, um, as well as a withdrawal trial as N against Stellara. And this is actually showing up to 60% achievement in PASI 100. So you're seeing a lot of splash in the American um, Academy of Derm world um, in, in some of these IL-17 um, measures. Um, here's just um, an abstract form showing the PASI 100 um, up to 60% in sort of the blue, blue line up on top, the light blue line, um, uh, against the uh, other comparators, um, which include um, Pixikizumab in different doses versus placebo. So IL-1223, this um, is probably more readily used in the psoriasis world. Um, it's uh, Q12-week dosing. It has some uh, benefits also of uh, being able to be weight-based a little bit. So this, uh, you know, is uh, a popular and in sort of the derm world. In terms of the uh, joint space, um, we do see some efficacy, but probably not as robust as what we're used to with some of our other agents. Um, so here you see ACR 20, 50, and 70, um, as well as PASI 75. So about 60% in PASI 75, so a little bit lower than some of the IL-17s um, uh, that are out now, but this is, um, its advantages are the Q12 dosing that I, Q12 week dosing that I talked about, um, as well as its uh, low side effect um, profile. So what's new in this area and why I brought it up is there was um, an exciting study um, presented in the derm world um, called uh, VIPU. Um, and what they did was, uh, as you know, there's a lot of cardiovascular risk. And so they uh, took some patients uh, before and after Stellara and uh, did a PET scan looking for um, in vascular inflammatory changes. And uh, what they found here after tw as little as 12 weeks, um, that they were significantly reducing um, inflammation in other vascular beds, um, the effect on par with statins um, in patients that had uh, moderate to severe psoriasis. So whether or not this sort of decrease in, in sort of the other vascular beds in the aortic um, inflammatory wall will translate into actual reduction in cardiac risk, we don't know yet. But the reason that this was so uh, uh, special was that the same study was actually done with adalimumab, and it did not show any difference in aortic inflammation. So um, this is the same group, um, but however, um, IL-1223 inhibitor uh, Stellara did show, so that's why I brought it to your attention. Uh, this is the CLEAR study. It's a little older study, but um, I thought I'd mention it only because um, it is a, a secukinumab against eustekinumab, and it's for the skin. And the reason that this, I wanted to highlight this is that, um, that they're having, you know, issues in the derm world trying to decide which one, you know, when the joints are all equal, how do you look at these, um, cytokine therapies in, in terms of the skin. And it looks like secukinumab here in the clear, in the clear study head-to-head -head, um, does have uh, some improvement of skin over um, eustekinumab. So if you have that patient that has more recalcitrant um, skin disease, um, these data may become more important. And then the newer ones are the IL-23 um, inhibitors. Um, so I have a little less to talk about this. Uh, uh, Galcelcomab is approved for psoriasis, so many, many of us may have some experience um, when you share with dermatologists, uh, but they are doing um, psoriatic arthritis trials, and then um, tildrakizumab um, in abstract form, they're showing some improvement for PSA, so more to come on that. And then the new, new um, IL-23, um, that's only in phase two studies you see here is risikizumab, but it's showing some persistency um, out to uh, 52 weeks, no serious side effects thus far, and they're 
expected um, some, some time in 2019. So I only have really early um, data to share with you on this IL-23 inhibitor. Um, moving on to JAX, we talked a lot about that already this morning, uh, but um, uh, the JAK inhibitors um, is one of the newer ones for psoriatic arthritis, so I thought I'd mention that since it's um, just approved. We have a lot of experience in, in our RA world, um, and so these are the overview of JAX um, in sort of in development for psoriatic arthritis. Um, so tofacitinib, which we know the best, and then varicitinib, um, and um, fungolinib um, that are um, in earlier trials for psoriatic arthritis. And these are obviously attractive in terms of being an oral alternative. Uh, so here's um, just going over the opal data really briefly uh, of tofacitinib, uh, looking at ACR 2050-70 for um, psoriatic arthritis patients. Um, and there's also um, some early data on um, ankylosing spondylitis as well in tofacitinib. Um, and here we see that um, the higher dose of tofacitinib also um, does help in terms of the ASAS-20 um, uh, response um, in um, ankylosing spondylitis. So. And last but not least, the newest to the market, um, once again, we're familiar with it in the RA world, is abatacem, Um And that's shown uh, to, and as you can see, there's a red dot over, um, I should mention, in the ankylosing spondylitis world. So see, many of these are going forward in the psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis space, but not necessarily in the AS space. Um, so this was most recently approved. Um, there was um, some early studies done in the AS uh, world that didn't show major response, so they're not moving on um, in terms of ankylosing spondylitis. But the Astria study showed um, some uh, moderately robust, robust response to the ACR20 in terms of uh, a psoriatic arthritis um, and only a modest improvement in skin. So this is somebody that maybe has more skin, uh, I'm sorry, more joint um, and less skin disease um, where this would be a good candidate. I'm just going to end with, we talked a little, I think Dr. Looney talked a little bit about um, the ROAR inhibitors. Um, these are um, still in sort of preclinical stage, um, oral small molecules affecting more upstream, um, and just thought I'd mention it since this is a uh, small molecule, um, attractive um, a potential option um, for, it's being studied in uh, psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, as well as ankylosing spondylitis. So I do have just a couple of minutes, and just to remind us that um, just like in the RA world, we do have treat to target in the spondy world, um, although it's not yet that mature because we're not agreeing on the target, so it makes treat to target a little more difficult. This is the MDA, just to remind the group, there's a minimum disease activity that we could hit in psoriatic arthritis uh, where you have to have about five out of the seven um, in order to be deemed uh, minimal disease activity. And then the more traditional look at treat to target is the Tycopa study. Uh, so this is looking at uh, usual standard care um, versus uh, tight control, where um, at every 12 weeks um, you have to uh, reach a uh, target. Um, and basically um, these bar graphs are showing that in the tight control group that it was significantly greater improvements in the signs and symptoms of disease um, as well as in um, as well as in psoriasis. So both um, the skin and the joints um, benefit um, from this. So my last slide is just to remind us, wow, we have so many um, different uh, pathways and targeted therapies that we could hit. Um, we know that uh, even though we're most comfortable with anti-TNF, that there's still a percentage of patients that do not respond um, to anti-TNF. We know that um, I would love to have a biomarker to predict, because right now, um, you know, it's a little bit of trial and error to see which patients uh, would respond best to which treatment. Cost issues. Um, I think there's also a lot of issues um, that may affect the spondyloarthritis world a little more in terms of looking at skin arthritis as well as enthesitis, dactylitis, and all the other um, comorbidities that can occur. Um, and then one of my areas of interest is really to better understand, um, since we know that psoriasis precedes psoriatic arthritis, is there a way that we can better see, because we know that these patients can have disease up to 10 years um, before psoriatic arthritis, it would be really great to um, be able to fine tune that path um, so that they can get to us earlier. Thank you.